By popular demand, we're going to make a close study of the lake boat Arthur M. Anderson. The vessel is best known for her role during the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald on Lake Superior. On the night of November 10th, 1975, the Anderson was between 11 and 9 miles in trail of the Fitz and was the last one to be in visual, radio, and radar contact with the doomed ore boat. She was also one of the only two vessels that decided to leave the shelter of Whitefish Bay and go back into the storm-churned lake to search for survivors. In this program we'll examine her shipyard drawings. It is very important to keep in mind that these historic images are from the year 1951 and there are many modifications that have altered the vessel since that time. The numbers that we'll be talking about and the equipment that I'm showing you are from the 1951 fact sheet. So please do not pepper me with comments about how I'm wrong about this or that. Things change over the years. Launched on Saturday, February 16, 1952, the new lake boat was the second of three AAA class boats for the Pittsburgh Steamship Company. She measured 647 feet in length, 70 feet in beam, and 36 feet in depth, with a capacity of 21,000 tons at her midsummer draft of 26 feet. Her cargoes were carried in three holds that loaded through 19 hatches, each of which was sealed with a single piece steel hatch cover. In our tour, we'll be seeing the boat through a top view, one deck at a time. There's a lot to highlight here, so sometimes we'll move fast. If you miss something, just pause and scroll back. That's the advantage of video. It's easy to rewind and play again. We'll begin with her engine room deck. This is her engine. It's a 7,700 horsepower cross-compound steam turbine engine built at Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company in Pittsburgh. The engine spun her propeller shaft. These are the shaft bearings. The boat burned heavy fuel oil contained in these two tanks. These are her ballast pumps, one for the port side, one for the starboard side. Her auxiliary condensers are represented here. The circulation pumps are here. Lube oil coolers and their pumps are seen here. These are the pumps for firefighting water. Reserve feed water is stored in this tank. These are the ballast priming pumps. Auxiliary ballast pumps are located here. Denoted only as, quote, heating boiler, unquote, my guess is this is the donkey boiler for winter layup. Now we climb up one deck to the operating deck. Again we see the fuel tanks extended up from the deck below. Additionally, we see the donkey boiler also extended up from the deck below. These are the main boilers that provide the steam for the engine. Seen here are the holding tanks for the vessel's drinking water. And this is the holding tank for the sewage. It's important not to confuse the two. Electric current for the entire vessel was provided by these two generators. All of the vessel's critical workings were monitored at these control panels. A lot of folks wonder why there is this huge open area that extends all the way up to the roof in every vessel's engine room. It's called the boiler trunk or the engine trunk and dates back to the earliest days of steamboating. It serves well when you have to remove, service, or completely change the vessel's engine or boiler. Instead of ripping out decks, cabins, and walls, you already have the space to remove the engine or the boiler or large related equipment. Now we'll venture up to the main deck aft. And once more we start with the fuel tanks. These were neighbored with smaller tanks for diesel use and day use. Next we see the hydraulic steering equipment. The oil pumps are located here. This is the galley's water heater. This is the sanitary water heater. And this is the 200 kilowatt diesel generator that is the backup for the main generator. This is the vessel's machine shop lathe, the drill press, grinders, power hacksaw, and vise, and of course the workbench. 
seemingly out of place is the meat freezer and frozen food locker. In the throwback to the pre-taconite days, this is the ore thawing heater. Natural ore has a high moisture content and will freeze during winter operations. These heaters were needed to thaw it out for better handling. This is the chief's engine room office. The mechanical spares room and one of the most used rooms on any vessel, the paint locker. Here we see the mooring winch that is located out on the spar deck. And finally again, the engine and boiler trunk space. Now let's head up to the spar deck cabin. We'll start with the absolute most critical room on any lake boat, the galley. Its pantry and the freezers and refrigerators. Here is the cruise mess. Guests are not allowed to dine in the cruise mess. I know, I tried it and was flatly told, no you can't. Some traditions are quite firm. And the officer's mess, where the guests eat too. Here's the cook's room. Oddly, there is no chief cook's room. Here are the quarters for the porters. The crew is provided with a substantial recreation room. Deckhands are provided with three identical cabins and four nice bathrooms. Oilers, firemen, and maintenance men all had nice cabins and nice bathrooms. I found it interesting that this vessel has a, quote, hospital or sick bay. And since we're on the spar deck, the boat's towing and mooring winches are on the fantail. And now it's up to the poop deck cabin. This is where the engineering officers reside. You'll notice that the rooms are traditionally arranged so that the highest ranking engineers are the least walking distance from access to their engine room. We'll start with the fourth assistant engineer, then the third assistant engineer, next the second assistant engineer, and the first assistant engineer. Of course, the chief engineer gets quarters that rival the captain, an office, and a bedroom. There's an old saying, captains come and go, but it's the chief's boat. Last but not least is this spare room. You'd think with all of the extra space, they could have at least given the first cook his own room. Now let's venture forward to the bow. This is the main deck. The forward crew has a recreation room. There's a paint room and a lamp room. This open extra space is usually where you find the exercise equipment, sometimes some weights, usually an extra cycle, sometimes a treadmill, which are all rarely used. Up these stairs, and they take us to the spar deck. Here we have the wheelsman's room, wheelsman and watchman's room, and a watchman. And they all have their own water closets, which is a fancy way to say toilet and sink. There's the bosun's room. Next there's the third mate, second mate's room, and first mate's room. And then there's the mate's office. Next we go up on the Texas deck and we find that the captain has the entire Texas deck and only has to share it with the occasional guests. There's the captain's room with his office and his bedroom and a bathroom with a tub and a toilet. Then there are two very nice staterooms, each of which has two beds. Through the door of stateroom number one, you're led into a nice sitting room. There's a couch, some easy chairs, a table for playing cards, and assorted other things such as video players, stereos, and a lot of reading material. The lounge itself has a series of 18-inch portholes. And although that obstructs the view, there's a very good purpose for them. Waves crashing over the bow can actually cave in picture windows if they're in this area. So portholes are required. There is a side door that leads out onto the open deck and you can stand on the forepeak as you sail across the Great Lakes. Now let's look at the pilot house. 
The pilot house is a fairly simple layout. You have the general pilot house area where the wheelsman stands in the middle, and the captain sits on the uh, right hand starboard side. And from there, you can get back to the chart room. There is also an internal companionway that leads up and down from the pilot house. Frankly, that's my favorite way to get in and out of the pilot house, especially in the winter. In the spring of 1975, at Fraser Shipyards in Superior, Wisconsin, the Anderson was lengthened by 120 feet to give her an overall length of 767 feet. Then during the winter of 1981-82, at the same shipyard, she was converted into a self-unloader, which is the configuration that she remains in today. And so there we have the Arthur M. Anderson.